Okay, thank you for being patient with me. We'll go ahead and get started here. I have um, my Google presentation here set up, and that will be on the Region 10 Hangout for this virtual field trip. So everything you're seeing, I know it's kind of hard to see the, the text, but just know that you can find that presentation and go through all the slides at any time um, through that link. And Region 10 and I will be sharing that out or you can just Google Region 10 Hangouts and go to the Hangout page and see all the um, presentations like this one and the previous ones. So that'll be on there. I'm also going to be showing several videos during this presentation um, by sharing my screen. You won't be able to hear any of the sound on those, but um, again, links to most of them will be in the um, presentations as well. And um, mainly just want to show some of the resources that I have for virtual field trips. So now we're a little bit behind here. Um, start off just with, I, I think it's important to understand what a virtual field trip is and what the purpose is. So this is just one of my favorite quotes that I found um, about a virtual field trip. I think the key word here is experience. Um, the uh, What I try to do in my classroom is to give children experiences that they wouldn't have otherwise whether it be um, they don't have the funds or the experiences or the time or that we just physically couldn't do some of these things without the technology that we have provided to us. There are two types of field trips that are important to talk about. The um, first one being pre-developed, which means you're going to a website that's already developed that for you or a teacher developed where you go through and kind of make that on your own. And I see here on the chat that they said that the links are already on the Hangout. So if you're in, if you're in the Hangout, you can just use that link or again, we will tweet that out um, later. And then the, um, I think it's really important that the virtual field trips aren't just a standalone activity. So I felt this quote was very important when you're looking into creating a virtual field trip or talking about a virtual field trip, that it's something that's integrated into the curriculum. It's integrated into a whole process of what you're doing with the learning, that you're not just saying, hey, we're going to take this virtual field trip and then it doesn't connect to the learning of what you're doing in the classroom. So I think those are just important things to consider as you look um, into adding or enhancing the virtual field trips in your classroom. One of the things that I do in my class, I teach kindergarten, so um, one of the things that I really strive to do with anything that we do using technology is to connect, to connect the concrete and the abstract. And by that, I mean the fact that you are taking a virtual field trip or connecting with someone online or communicating with somebody virtually, all that's a very abstract um, concept, especially for young kids. And I think it's important that we understand that and, and work to build that connection that we are doing real things, that we are taking you to real places, and that it's not just this virtual world that we've created. And so to do that in my classroom, I always start with um, something tangible. So last year and this year, I started with by connecting with our librarian. Um, we've done a Skype call and a Google Hangout, and the purpose of that is that the kids see we, we can see her virtually through our iPad or through our projector, but then we take a trip down to the library and see that she's a real person and it's a real place. And what we did this year was actually the first interaction my kids had with um, our librarian, and so they got to um, talk to her for a few minutes on the... Google Hangout and then we went down to the library and she talked to us and did some of the, the classroom rules in the library and such. So it's just a really good way to bridge that in the early in the year that we're, we're talking to people virtually but they also are real people. Um, probably the, the tool I use the most for virtual field trips would be Google Earth. It's um, an extremely a powerful platform. It's available on every device. It doesn't matter what kind of device you use. The, um, the tools that we use the most, the three tools that we use the most, I've kind of highlighted, and um, I'm going to show you a quick little video on some of those. 
But I just want to point out, I think a lot of times people use Google Earth and they don't even pay attention to all the different um, layers that you can put in there or the boxes that you can check to turn things on or to remove things on there. We use that a lot. The kids want to see what the weather is. Typically in my classroom, I have most of these boxes unchecked so that it's just the Earth we're looking at. The main ones that I keep on there are the boundaries and the weather. But we can also add the pictures or remove the pictures and the panoramics and all those different things that are on there as you see fit in the, fit in the lessons. I like to keep it cleaner so I keep most of them off. The first tool that um, we use in my classroom is, I, I call it the daylight tool. I don't even know what, if it even has an actual name. But it's up here in, in the top of Google Earth and it has a sun on it. And when you click on that tool, it'll show you where it is daytime and where it is nighttime on the Earth in real time. And so if you're connecting with classrooms around the world or if you are connecting, um, taking a field trip different places, I think it's important to show the kids that um, how the Earth works in a real-time way. And so I think this, this really builds the basis of this global classroom that they understand how the sun affects and there's another cool feature on the daylight tool where you there's a slider where you can go back in time and see and so the kids love to see the sunrise across the United States and we play with that every once in a while in the morning if you want to see a video of exactly how that looks you can go to this YouTube link um, and it, I have a little YouTube video where I show you exactly how the um, daylight tool works another tool we use a lot is the measure tool and um, it simply just measures things in, the, you know, using Google Earth. If you've never tried it before, it's definitely one um, I suggest that you try out. I'm going to pull up this video here and play it. So you can see over here on the left-hand side, um, I just have an example of where you can turn off the different layers and turn them on, and um, different things will be removed. So on this example, I was actually measuring... Um, in Las Vegas from the Venetian to the Bellagio because I was walking that a lot when I was um, at ITHK in Vegas last summer so I, I kinda wanted to know how far it was and um, in this example video if you go on the YouTube I also show you how you can add labels or tags to different places we do that a lot in my class if there's different schools that we're connecting with different places we add these little tabs and labels um, frequently so that we can see different places and the kids and you can add different symbols and you can name them so you can see I'm putting a place mark here for the Venetian and you can title them you can change the colors of all these different push pins it's um, and I've noticed that my kids in the classroom are starting to do that on their Google Earth as well when they find things they like they they've watched me enough where they can add their own pins and they try to sound out and type the names of different things that they like um, so it's, it's a real cool feature for the upper levels of kids to create their own maps. So you can see I'm just place marking um, the two places, the Venetian and the Bellagio fountains. And then the, the measure tools up at the top, and it looks just like a ruler. A neat feature for, um, again, for the upper levels is they have all the different um, standard units of measuring. So if you want kids to measure in different standard units, then they can choose that on there. In my class, we use miles almost exclusively. And um, anytime we visit someone, we measure it. And they don't know that exactly what 2,526 miles is, but my kids do g gather an understanding since we measure things all the time when we're visiting them. They know that the McDonald's is a lot closer because it's only 2.4 miles as opposed to if we were to go to our Indonesian friends that are thousands of miles away and I think if you're if you're constantly measuring and showing them that the kids start developing an understanding of the size and the complexity of the earth. So that's one of the tools that we use a lot with the daylight tool. The other one is the path tool. And um, I have several videos on um, creating a path tool on this YouTube. And I have an example path video as well. So I want to show you that one. So this is an example path. When, when we first use Google Earth, I like to show the kids that, again, connecting that con concrete and abstract, I like to show them things that they will, 
would recognize in our city so they can see that Google Earth is showing them real things in the world. So over here on the left hand, hind, left hand side is our school. Over here in the top right is the big stadium that's in our city that all the kids pass all the time. They know all about it. So our first path that we created this year was from the school to the stadium. And if you create if you create a path and click this path tool, then it will kind of fly you on that tour of wherever you're going. And we, we use these paths all the time in my classroom for visiting different places. And there's a pause button and a play button. So as a teacher, as you're going along, you can pause and do different things. So in my classroom, we would have paused right here at the park. And I would have pointed out that this is the pond. A lot of you go fishing and have a picnics here and the playground. And I remember the first week of school, all the kids, you know, getting really excited because they started recognizing that we really were in our city. And I think that's important when you're using Google Earth, that it's not just this abstract thing for young kids. Again, I can point out the 7-Eleven over here on the right where they all get their Slurpees after school and, um, you know, the church that they passed and the high school. And then we go on to the stadium and they're able to kind of say, I've been there. I understand that Google Earth is showing us this view from above. And once they make that connection, the, I think Google Earth becomes a lot more powerful for the kids. And then just real quick, a, a neat tool with the, the Google Earth path is that you can do a past example. Down here on the bottom, there's a little slider. And um, if you create a path, you can go back in time and see what that looked like in the past. So on this one, I believe it's 2004 that I end up deciding to go. I wanted to go right before the school was built. And so it's the exact same path we just went on, except this time um, we're doing it in 2004. So there we go. There's right before the school was built, um, right at the beginning, or at the end of 2003. And so here's where the school should be. And as we're going along on the path, again, you can stop and pause it and show them that um, there's a lot of changes there. So here's the park that's just being built. And as they turn on here, they can see all the school, all the um, houses in the neighborhood haven't been built. We get up here to the 7-Eleven, it's not there, it should be right here, but that hasn't been built as well. So that's just a really neat feature for them to be able to go back in time and see how cities or places have changed. Of course, it's kind of limited. I think 1999 is as far back as Google goes on most places, which isn't that far, but um, for my kids, it's more than a lifetime. So it's, it's a lot of changes have happened in our city since then. So that's Google Earth and the Google Path tool. Again, if you want to see those tools and um, kind of see how I created them, you can use those YouTube links on there to check them out. And then I'd just like to point out, I think most people know, but um, occasionally I come across at the top of Google, there's a Google Earth, there's a little icon that um, looks like a planet. And when you click on it, you have four choices, Google Earth, Google Sky, Google Mars, and Google Moon. And Google Moon is very popular in my classroom. It has a lot of um, different places that you can click on. I know it's hard to see on here, but there's a lot of little dots around the moon where the kids can click on and see what satellite landed there or what astronaut walked there or it names different things. And so my kids love using that feature. Google Mars doesn't have as much as Google Moon, but um, they're adding more and more um, over the last couple of years as I've seen it. And then Google um, Sky is about the stars and the constellations. We don't use that much. It's pretty high level for my um, young kindergarten kids, but I can see some of the upper grades getting into it. So just know that those tools are there as well. And then, of course, there's a Google Earth app. It has... Um, a lot of the function as far as finding places, but the tools that I mentioned above, the path, the daylight, and the measuring tool, those kinds of things aren't on there. But my, my class does use the app occasionally when they want to search for different places on the earth. So I just like to point out that, you know, like if they wanted to search a city, they can still see different um, landmarks and pictures that people have added to the Google Earth. And then real quick before I go on to some of my other things, I did create a Pinterest board of some of my favorite um, virtual field trips. And I think there's 27 or 30 different ones. Some of them are actual just, you know, pre-done field trips. 
that I'll be showing you here, and some of them are just links to some of the best that people found. And um, so when I was putting this together, um, I, I kind of just created that resource. So, so feel free to um, check that out if you want to see. There's some on there that I don't talk about in this presentation. All right, the, the next virtual field trip that I'd like to share is the World Wonders Project. And it's actually changed its name to the Cultural Institute Project through Google. Um, I still call it the World Wonders Project because that's what I'm used to and that's what my kids refer to it as. It looks a little different um, than the example that I have here saved. But if you go to this link on here, and again, I have it on the Region 10 website, it'll take you to that, that project and you can search different um, parts of the world. So I'll just show you what one of those looks like. I hope. Here we go. So this is the Great Barrier Reef, and I just recorded a video of me going through it like the kids would. It's very intuitive to use. It has the little um, arrow icons up here on the top left for the kids to navigate. It's um, I found that my kindergarten kids can use it very very easily. I can just bookmark it, and um, they're able to navigate it. So I'll just press play and show you kind of what it looks like when the kids are navigating. So as you scroll around, you'll see these little white arrows pop up, and then they know they can go on. And this is the Great Barrier Reef. It's one of my favorite ones to explore. I love the ocean. I love sea turtles. So it's been very popular in my class as well. So as you can see, pretty simple to, to explore, and they have they have tons of different um, places to explore. Here's another one. This one's Italy. If I could pronounce that, I would, but it's somewhere in Italy is all I know. I actually used this in a lesson last year when we were talking about families and houses, and um, we used the World Wonder Project, and I found three or four different places around the world where they showed the housing. And we talked about, we you know, did compare and contrast on how people live in Dallas compared to you know, Italy and I forget the other two places that we explored. But that their, you know, their living must be a lot different because they live on the ocean and their houses were a lot different as you saw in the beginning. It's just a great way to connect um, the differences around the world. We'll move on to the next one is the 360s.net. It, um, it does have an app. There's a free one and a paid one. I've, I've never needed to, to pay or s seen any reason to pay, but um, you know, maybe at some point it'll be where you have to. I've been able to do everything that we need to do just with a free, and we usually use it on the web more than app anyway. But you can see all those little dots or pictures of different places where they have taken a 360-degree view of some historic place or some event. It's a lot like the World Wonder Project except that it's one spot so you can't move around like on the sea turtle you saw where you could kind of explore. This one's just one place, one spot in time and a 360 degree to view. And so my favorite three um, I'm going to share with you here. This is the um, Mongolia Lantern Festival. So I'll just press play. It has the same kind of um, navigation as the World Wonder Project on the top left. It has a little um, arrows in the scroll, and you can zoom in and out. And you can see as you go around, you can on most of these you can go a complete 360 degree to view up, down, all around. And it's it's just fascinating. We did this for a writing um, prompt last last year, and I'll probably do it again this year where the, um, we just put some of these on the board and I show them the 360 view and they write about it or ask questions about it and they just use it as their writing prompt. So that's, that's one of them that I love. Here's another one in Iran. This is a museum. We use this picture for patterns when we're talking about patterns in math and we zoomed in a lot of the patterns and the kids use these examples um, of different ways to make tiles and they kind of design their own little wall 
using these patterns as kind of ideas and the colors and it was really neat for them to kind of uh, see a real world example of an artist and and talk about how those patterns work and the different some of the things are very you know random but there's as we look closer we saw a lot of different the same kinds of shapes and, and talked about that and it's just neat to to make those connections with the kids on a real place and then here's the last one this is probably my favorite this is the um, London Paralympic Games in 2012 We did this one for a writing activity as well, and, and again, I just I love the uh, um, the emotion that that you can see. You can see the people's faces, and and we talked about that when I when I showed my class of what it must have felt like to be there, and what it would feel like to be an Olympic athlete or to be part of the show. And again, it's just kind of bringing those experiences to my kids that they might not actually have a chance. And, you know, I, I touched on that a little bit earlier with the experiences. And to me, when people ask me what's the biggest difference between our low-income children and our high-income children, the answer I would give would be experiences. And it, it's not really the money itself. It's the experiences that that money provides, that they've been on a plane before, that they've been on, you know, vacations, and they know what the ocean's like, and they they can kind of make those connections. So I think with virtual field trips, you can you can touch on that. You can kind of get to that if you really immerse them. I know with that Google Path tool that I showed earlier, where um, you're kind of flying to different places. I, I've heard of schools and classrooms where the teacher will go as far as to have the kids get their passports and their tickets on the plane, and they'll actually take a trip to Australia, and they'll fly across using the Path tool, and um, you know, set up set up the chairs in front of the screen, and and, and kind of make it like they're really going there. And I think that's some of the things you can do with technology that's really fun. The next one I want to share is the Decora Eagles. This one's been really fun. Right now, the um, the Eagles have been hatching in in their nest, so it's been really fun watching the Decora Eagles. It's just a live webcam of eagles. Um, and you can turn on any time, so I turn it on like when we're cleaning up or a lot of times during our journal time, I'll just turn it on and they can watch and see what's happening. I'll give you just a little quick um, preview here of what it looks like. This is actually a recording, but like I said, when you go to it, it's live. And so they get to see they get to see all the aspects of the eagle taking care of the eggs. They actually get to see the different food that they bring back, fish and squirrels and rabbits and you name it. And then the best part is when, when the, um, the eggs actually hatch, they get to see them take care of them. So you can imagine the excitement of the kids watching that and seeing, um, you know, the eagles taking care of their babies. And I don't believe you can hear the sound when I play that video, but um, there is sound there, and you can hear the birds chirping. And we, we talk a lot about the habitats, and we can hear the wind. We um, we've been to the place on Google Earth to kind of see where it's at, that it's on a farm. And my favorite thing about these webcams that I'm sharing, the Decor Eagles, the first one, I have a couple other are that these are webcams where there's someone always monitoring the webcam and so if there is any action they're always moving the camera and following what's happening and I, I think that helps keep the kids in, engaged. So next one I want to share is the San Diego webcams. We also use the National Zoo and DC webcams pretty frequently. San Diego are my favorite. We, we spend most of our time looking at those if we're going to be looking at a webcam but it's common for my kids to ask to turn on the, the panda webcam or turn on the elephant webcam when we're cleaning up or when we're transitioning and again during writing time. And I think it's really cool, especially for young kids, to get a chance to have something to look at, to something to use 
to spark their imagination and spark their curiosity. If they want to write about what they're seeing, they can definitely do that. These, um, these webcams, again, have people monitoring them as part of their um, research on the animals. So if there's something happening in the habitat, it's, um, you'll be able to see that it's going on. The, um, the webcams at the zoos aren't as consistent with having animals in there. So usually early in the morning is when we find them the most, like when you go to a typical zoo. But um, like here's an example of a polar bear we watched one day, and I just recorded it for the presentation. And you can see someone is monitoring the camera, so they're zooming in and out. And as the animals move, they're also following them. Okay, and then here is the, here's a quick example of the elephant. Again, it's the same thing. I think that, and if you, if you Google animal webcam or zoo webcam, there's a lot of other examples out there to use. I just tend to stick with the San Diego and the DC um, the most because that um, seems to be plenty for me. Next we're going to move on to YouTube. Um, I, think, I think in most cases it's starting to change as I present. I'm starting to hear more and more where schools are allowing YouTube, but um, it's definitely more than Charlie bit my finger. There's, I think you could do a complete year-long study virtual field trips just with YouTube clips and um, be set just because of how much content's there. The, um, the biggest thing with YouTube is there's a fear of what the kids are going to see and all the suggested videos and such. So if you don't know about the different tools on cleaning up YouTube, um, I wanted to share that real quick as part of the virtual field trip because I think at times people don't use YouTube because they're scared of it. The tool I use is safeshare.tv. And again, that's in the Region 10 links and it's down here as well on the next slide, um, the link to that. But SafeShare takes all the suggested videos on the right-hand side and all the suggested videos at the end of the video plus any advertisements before the video and removes them all. So you just get a clean-looking um, video on there. So here's kind of, let me show you an example of what it looks like to make a SafeShare video. So this is how you make it. I'm going to be using, this is um, the Canadian astronaut we watched a lot of his videos the last couple of years. It's a great way to take a field trip to outer space. He has some amazing um, videos on d different things like how he eats and how he cooks and how he takes care of himself. All, I mean, just all kinds of different things in outer space. So this is just a quick video. So up here in the top, you're going to see I'm going to copy the actual YouTube link, and then I'm going to type in safeshare.tv. And when you say share.tv opens up, you're going to get this generate safe link. So I'm going to paste in the YouTube link, YouTube link I copied and press generate safe link. And at the bottom it says take me to the safe view. And then this is what the kids actually see on a safe share video. If there are any advertisements before the video, again, that's removed. You can see on the right hand side, nothing is there. And my favorite part at the end of the video, there are no suggested videos. That box of 20 little boxes that show up that you never know what's going to be there, that's removed as well. So it's a safe way to show videos. This, this safe share link that you get when you create, you are able to bookmark that. So you can save that and use it. Um, so you can do it ahead of time and have this safe share. If I'm um, doing something in my classroom and the kids want me, like earlier this week we were talking about insects and they – we got on the, the topic of dung beetles, and they really wanted to see one because they loved knowing that there's a bug that eats poop, and that's really exciting in kindergarten. So real quickly, I turned off my projector. I searched YouTube for a um, video of the beetle, and then within 10 seconds, I had created, changed it over to SafeShare, so I didn't have to worry about what was going to be next to the video or the advertisements. 
and I was just able to play it quickly. So that's something that I use a lot in my classroom with Safe Share. And here's an example of exactly what it looks like. Again, this is the Canadian ad astronaut. So this is exactly what the kids see. So that's, that's a really cool video because he shows them how to make a peanut butter sandwich in space. And we actually did that last year and, and used what he used to create it and, and did a couple of science experiments. He talks about how they package things so it doesn't get old and moldy. And we did a couple of experiments with that. So it's a, again, there's tons of things on YouTube to create. And then SafeShare is a great way to make them clean to use. There's also ViewPure is another great way. I, I prefer SafeShare. I've tried all the other ones that I've heard of and I prefer this one, but um, there are other options out there just in case. It is important to note that it's still playing from YouTube. So if YouTube's blocking your district, this isn't going to be a way around it, but it is a way to have that conversation with the decision makers and say, here is a tool where I can make YouTube safe if you allow me access to it. And um, at the very bottom right, there's a little YouTube button. So if the kids press on that, they can still go to YouTube. But um, in my class, that's not an issue because the kids don't actually use the Safe Share. It's mainly for my teaching and for our experiences. But I just want to note those things. The next website I want to share for virtual field trips is Wonderopolis. It's um, been a game changer for me the last, um, I want to say four years now, and maybe three, but I think it's four years that I've been using Wonderopolis. The link is on here, wonderopolis.org. And what Wonderopolis does is they do a wonder of the day every day. And so the example here is why can't penguins fly? And a couple of things that make this really valuable, and especially in the elementary classroom, is there's always a video involved. My favorite thing about the videos is they don't tend to answer the question, but they're connected to the topic. And so I like they don't answer the question because it's something that my kids can wonder about a lot. They have all the content you would need as a teacher to share with the kids the answer to the question. So if you're not an expert on why penguins can't fly or what, or what scientists say or the reasoning, all the content is down there. It is geared towards, I would say, a third or fourth grade reading level. So in my kindergarten class, this is done whole group. We explore these um, wonders, and I help read to them. But there's also a listen button where it'll read to them. There's all vocabulary from the wonder over here. I think this would be great for the upper levels. Um, and when you click on it, it tells you a definition. And then they have a wonder gallery where you can find different pictures about the wonder. So Wonderopolis is a great way to go on virtual field trips to different places. I think they're up, um, they've been doing it for, like I said, almost four years now. So they're, I think, 1,200 or 1,300 is, is how many wonders they have on there. It is searchable. It's like, a, it's like a science dictionary for kids now where if you want to type in frogs and see what they have on there, they have it categorized. It's really just an amazing website. In my classroom, we start off every morning with a wonder of the day, and I have a picture on the board, and the kids wonder. They have a wonder journal. Um, if you search wonder journal on my website, you can see more details on how I use it that way. For this particular example, the kids, we worked together to come up with reasons why we thought they couldn't fly. So, you know, in kindergarten, they're too heavy, they're too cold because they eat fish, and then we would watch the video and um, use that video to kind of learn more and connect more about the different topic. Here's another example. Who lives on Easter Island was something that we did. And then afterwards, my kids asked me, what is a, um, how are islands made? And so those are the kind of questions that come up a lot when we wonder. And we use Wonderopolis. There's a, it just kind of feeds the, the wonder and and excitement that my kids have naturally and it leads to other topics and other questions. So we, we ended up talking, we, we watched videos about volcanoes and talked about how most volcanoes are formed that way and then they realized well if a volcano is created an island and it's made out of rock then how does it turn into an island? And so we went on this you know long learning tangent of how islands can kind of turn into livable places for animals and how those animals might get there. You can see I'm an amazing artist with boats and they can float 
and some of them fly and such. But so what what I did with Wonderopolis for the people who are just getting started with it is I went and created my 50 favorite wonders for young kids. I would say this is kind of a K2, K3 um, board, but it's it could definitely be used K through 5. I think all the way through 5th grade kids would, would enjoy these videos and these wonders. If you're not familiar with Symbaloo, um, that's something I would definitely suggest t checking out. These, these squares are like um, a... I call it a visual bookmarking tool. So when they click on the tiles, it'll take them to the link. So instead of having a favorites, we use Symbaloo in my, cl in my class in kindergarten a lot. So this link will take you to the Kinder Chat Symbaloo where you'll find it. It looks just like this, the Wonderopolis. All right, I know I'm running out of time since we started a little late, so I'm just going to kind of go through these a little quick, quicker than I had planned. Museum of Natural History, if you've never checked it out, it has an amazing tour. The downside to their tour is that it uses a lot of bandwidth, and so I've um, different places that I've gone, I've noticed that it can load slowly. So that'd be one that I would just check out ahead of time on your network, but it's really a cool um, tool to use. Scholastic has tons of pre-made field trips all done for you. If you use this link, it'll take you to the student activities, and if you search virtual field trip on their site, they had, and so you can see here, they had different virtual field trips for social studies and science and math, and it's all done. They even have the lesson plans laid out for you and the different things. It's a great place to start if you're looking to encourage teachers to, to get started using virtual field trips. My favorite that they've done is the Plymouth Plantation. We do this every Thanksgiving with my kids in kindergarten. Parts of it are a little bit above their head, so I pick and choose um, what parts of the video I want them to see. But um, here's, a, here's kind of just a quick example of what it looks like. But they have the actual virtual plantation that they take the kids to. But it, that one's really neat because it takes them into a um, replica house and the different tools they would use and you know my kindergarten class definitely finds it fascinating with um, you know trying those different things out as far as websites and, and where to go and what to do I, I think the biggest thing is let the kids lead you is what are, what are they interested in what, what do they show excitement for you know when my class like I said that last week got excited about the dung beetles and they wanted to see that then we just went with it and we ended up doing a lot of really cool learning about insects that was led by them and that I was using technology to feed it. That when they had a question about how a praying mantis works or how it eats or how bees fly and different things, I was able to find really cool videos and kind of just keep that imagination and curiosity going and it led to other things in the classroom that we could do and create with. Just real quickly, I've talked about this before in some of my other presentations. I think video conferencing, Google Hangouts, Skyping is a great way to do a virtual field trip, especially if you're connecting with experts in fields. They, um, we, I was just tweeting with um, NBC5 sports reporter about the Final Four. He saw one of my tweets and he responded and I asked him, I was like, are you interested in um, hanging out with my kindergarten class and kind of talking about sports reporting? Because I definitely have some boys that would be interested in that. And so we're going to work on setting that up. And I think if, if you're just, if you'll find what your class is interested in, there's experts everywhere that will be willing to come into your classroom virtually somehow and share their passion with kids. A really cool way to do virtual field trips and a very easy way for, to do virtual field trips is with pictures. Every time we have a break, spring break, winter break, or just um, at the beginning of the year, I tell my parents, if you do something really exciting with your family, send us as many pictures as you can, and I'll put it together in a slideshow, and we'll talk about those different things. And so, you know, we can talk about mountains, and we can talk about different things, and it's something that they're excited about because one of their friends is in the picture. And it's something that the kid who brings the pictures in is really excited about. I know with... You know, the low SES schools, maybe your kids don't get to go to Hawaii every summer, but still, if they go to the grocery store and they put together five or six pictures, that could be a really cool virtual field trip for your classroom. It's just encouraging parents, parents to send that in 
so that you can put that together. So I think that's an easy way to um, kind of go on virtual field trips with your classroom where it's connected to them. Another tool I use a lot are audio files. Freesound is my favorite one to visit. Um, I use this in writing time probably the most, but again, if, if, if I'm putting together an elaborate virtual field trip, I'll try to bring in sounds as part of that experience as well. But most of the time I just use it for our writing where I'll put up a sound, the kids will guess where it is. Sometimes I'll add the picture like this. Sometimes I'll just play the sound um, without a picture and they have to write like we'll do rainforest or thunderstorm or a helicopter and the kids will use that as part of their writing. Sound Bible is another site that I've used occasionally, but again the free sound is the one that I use the most. And then more than anything, I think the most underused thing in the classroom is pictures, whether it's taking kids taking pictures or teachers finding pictures, that we have this just amazing resource with images. And these are my four favorite where I pull things from. If you have discovery education in your district, and I know a lot of Texas districts do, all those images that you can search for in discovery education, you have the copyright release to use them in your class classroom however you want. You can save them, you can print them, you can display them, you can, you know, whatever you want to do, that's part of that discovery education um, subscription. Creative Commons is another way to find images that you can use without um, copyright issues as far as kids creating presentations and those. So if, if you're not familiar with Creative Commons, it's, it's a great place to search. Down here at the bottom, there's a button that says Find CC um, License Worked. And then I tend to use Google the most when I'm searching on Creative Commons, but you can see there's a lot of other um, options and choices on there when you're searching. And then the other thing I do, um, I don't have this video to show you, but anytime I go on a, field, on a trip or anytime I do anything fun, I always take pictures and videos and I put it together as a slideshow for my kids so that I can bring those experiences to my classroom. Last summer I went to ITHK in Vegas and so I took tons of pictures of, you know, from checking bagging to walking on the plane. The, the pilots even let me take a picture of the cockpit and what the seats look like. And I know I have three or four kids in my class that have never been on an airplane. They don't know what it looks like when you, when you look out the window and you can see the clouds flying. And so I have all those different things in this video and I'm able to kind of help them make those connections. So I think teachers can put together slides and videos as well as an easy way to bring experiences to their class. Um, here's another, if you've never heard of stembyte.com, I definitely suggest you check it out. Andrew's got to some amazing videos. It's all upper level math. I think he does physics and calculus and um, all those things that I don't, you know, remember anymore, but he has some amazing videos. If you want to see what the future of education is as far as um, giving kids experiences, what he does is uses Google Glass um, to do online videos for schools around the country that just don't have the resources to do the higher level math. And he's, he's put together some great videos. So I think I always tell people this is like the future of experiences for kids. So if you want to check out um, where this is going, I definitely suggest you to head over to stembyte.com and look through some of the cool videos that he has. You probably won't understand a lot of the math that he's talking about, but you can see where those um, experiences enhance the learning. So that's all I have to share today. I know I went through some of those kind of fast to catch up on time, but again, I have all the links on there for you. My contact information is there. The Region 10 Hangout, um, again, like I said, the easiest way to find it if you don't have a link is to Google R10 Hangouts or Region 10 Hangouts. And I found it, it comes up one of the first or two choices on there. And then you can see this presentation along with the other four that I've already done and check out the schedule for what we have coming up. I know we have a couple of apps and um, web, uh, websites and Tech Tools for Teachers is another one that's coming up, so those are some great ones to check out. I appreciate everyone that joined the Hangout or anyone that watches it in the future, and I hope you will come back and check out the future ones. Thank you.
So that they'll they'll turn off the hangout in a few minutes and edit it, but Is there anyone that has any questions? I, I can see over here on the chat. Thank you, Diana. I appreciate that comment. Hopefully you found some things. If, like I said, if you have any questions or concerns, my contact information is there. But I, th I think it's just kind of realizing how much is out there and, and taking that step of, of looking for things that will work in your classroom.